Well, good morning, friends. Welcome to our service this morning at St. Mark's Presbyterian Church for Sunday, June 14th. Uh, I'm glad that you're able to join us. Um, we've been doing this for a number of weeks now, and I hope that all of you, uh, both St. Mark's congregation members and non-St. Mark's members, friends of, uh, friends of ours, I hope that you all have been enjoying our services, uh, finding it meaningful and helpful uh, as we navigate through this lockdown period. Uh, so let's prepare our hearts as we come before God, as we come together in our spirit as the people of God uh, to worship and praise. Just by way of uh, a couple of announcements, uh, we have a sad note to pass on to you. Uh, Margaret Siegel, uh, some of you may be familiar with her. Um, she was uh, around at St. Mark's a number of years ago. Uh, she passed away at the age of 90. Uh, she's the widow of Jerry Siegel uh, and daughter Karen and son Martin. So we just want to express our condolences to the family. We want to uphold you in our prayers. Uh, during this uh, time of grief and mourning. And we just want God to uh, be present uh, in your time together as family. Uh, and as you remember uh, Margaret and celebrate her memory. Uh, also, we have uh, a good note to pass on. Uh, this year, it marks the 35th year that our music director, George Helt, has been at uh, St. Mark's. And so, of course, we can't do anything right now because uh, of the lockdown, but uh, maybe uh, once the lockdown is lifted, perhaps in the fall, we'll have a big celebration uh, to recognize George. George, you want, do you wanna, I didn't mention this to him, but do you wanna come up and poke your head in and, and say hello to, to the St. Mark's community. Uh, George is truly uh, a blessing to St. Mark's. Uh, he comes with an immense, come on in, come on in. He comes with an immense, immense degree of skill, of talent, and spiritual giftedness in, in music. And we just want to appreciate his music ministry with us and for us. It's been my privilege and honor to be working uh, with George as we plan and prepare these weekly services. So congratulations, George. And we're going we're gonna to plan something great for you coming up in, in the next few months. Thank you. George. Thank you. So, thank you very much for your support over the years. And uh, look forward to a time when we can get back together again. Thanks, George. And as long as we're introducing people uh, behind the camera or in the front, we have Aaron as well. Aaron, you want to peek your head in? This is our associate minister, Aaron, the Reverend Aaron Cole. She didn't know I was going to do this either. So Aaron spends, Aaron spends hours and hours and hours editing all this and you'll never know how much work goes into uh, producing this every week. Um, it's, it's a tremendous uh, amount of work, uh, both in front of the camera and behind the camera. So thank you, Aaron. We come to God as brothers and sisters. Let's join together in the call to worship. Holy and generous is God, the author of all things. Loving and gracious is Christ, the bearer of our salvation. Gentle and wise is the Holy Spirit, the breath of new life. Come, let us worship God, creator, savior, and breath of new life. We praise God with joyful praise and hopeful hearts. So let's join together as we pray. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Merciful and compassionate God, you are overflowing with love, infinite in kindness, and incomparable in glory. 
You are the source of all good things. There is none like you. You bring new life forth from death and suffering and offer us hope. In you, all things work together for good. Your presence breaks into our lives in many ways and you touch us with wonder. In this time of worship, we offer you thanks with our prayers, praise with our hearts, and honor with our lives this day and every day. Patient and suffering God, we confess that we often stray from you. You have offered us peace, yet our lives feel frustrating and unsettled in these times. You offer us compassion, yet we feel neglected and resentful amid life's challenges. You show us justice, yet we are not committed to uphold the same justice for all our neighbors. Forgive us, O God, and draw our attention back to you. Ignite our hearts so that we might follow your guidance and trust you as our shepherd. We give you thanks and praise this day. We pray this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace with God, with yourself and with one another. Thanks be to God. And now let's uh, turn our hearts towards each other and share Christ's peace. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Let's turn to our first hymn. It's number 350 in your hymn books, To God Be the Glory.
Our responsive reading is Psalm 116, and let's join together. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 35 to chapter 10, verse 7. Let's join in the reading of the Word of God. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits, to cast them out, and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven, has come near. Let us give God thanks and praise for the reading of the Holy Word. The life of faith is the life of loving service in the name of Christ. It goes way beyond just getting the right beliefs, although that is important. The Bible consistently brings to the forefront the prime directive, so to speak, which is ministering and serving others in the world in the same spirit of Christ himself, in the same way, in the same manner, with the same heart and spirit as Jesus did. And in whatever manner Jesus did, that is our calling as well. Today's passage in Matthew is informally known as the Little Commission. And this is distinct from the Great Commission that we looked at last Sunday. And that Great Commission tells Christians, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And so today in this little commission, Jesus says, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
as you go, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. And so this passage highlights a very specific quality as Jesus uh, outlines this commission for us and lays out what's ahead of us in Christian service. And that is compassion. Compassion. As Jesus went about proclaiming the good news, healing and encouraging, it says he had compassion on them. Latin presents compassion as two words, com and pati, meaning to suffer with, to bear with. The original Greek talks about compassion as something that happens very deep inside our bodies. That's where we experience compassion. And so to have compassion or to be moved with compassion is to be moved as to one's bowels, as the Greek describes, to have our bowels yearn, so to speak. Because it was believed that the bowels were the seat of love and tenderness. That's where we are touched by compassion. That's where we feel it. That's where we experience it. And that's how deep compassion comes from. It's kind of like our modern term when we say something is gut-wrenching. We feel it so deep inside of us. And that's how powerful a human quality compassion is. Jesus is the embodiment of compassion. Now we have to be clear that compassion doesn't center on you, doesn't center on the person who is feeling it. Being a compassionate person isn't exhausted by the capacity just to feel really bad for someone. It's not a virtue of self-acclaim. It's not about you. The focus is on the person for whom your compassion is expressed. Compassion brings the aspect of relationship and relational care to center stage. Relationship and relational care is brought to center stage. And Jesus is the very essence of compassion and relational care. He challenges us to put our own desires aside and act compassionately towards others, particularly those who are in need or in distress. He has a special calling towards those. And Jesus exemplifies this time and time again when he demonstrated compassion to those society had condemned tax collectors, prostitutes, the culturally oppressed, criminals, all of the marginalized and outcasts. Jesus always, always sided with the weak, the outcast, the oppressed, the rejected, Compassion is so important that it's considered in almost all of the major religious traditions as among the greatest of virtues. In fact, some Bible scholars believe that in his ministry, Jesus actually elevated compassion as the supreme human virtue, capable of reducing suffering and fulfilling our God-ordained purpose of transforming the world according to God's good and perfect will. 
It was that important. It was that meaningful and powerful. The modern definition of compassion is a feeling of deep sorrow for one another who was stricken by misfortune, accompanied by a strong desire to alleviate the suffering. It's a twofold definition. What we feel and then what we are prompted to do for the other to alleviate their suffering. I recently read of one elementary school program that teaches the practice of compassion in clear and concrete ways to school children. And this is what they say. Compassion is how we treat ourselves and others. See, they avoid just focusing on the feeling aspect. Compassion is how we treat ourselves and others. And it says, compassion can be seen by how we choose our words and actions, how we choose to be kind even when others are not, how we forgive easily, how we are friendly to someone who needs a friend, how we embrace cultural differences, how we help others who are less fortunate, and how we look for ways to help in our community. That's a great description. It's a great instruction tool, clear advice, clear steps on how we can experience and practice compassion. So what does this little commission involve? Well, it involves the apostles doing as Jesus has been doing. It's the beginning of an extension of Christ's own ministry of compassion. We are extending Christ's ministry of compassion. And so the message is the same as his, the same as Christ's message, which is proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, which is what? Radical love, hope, mercy, acceptance, justice, forgiveness, and so on. Curing every disease, every sickness, and unclean spirit. What ails us? What sickness are we suffering from? What unclean spirit are we harboring? Our struggle as Christian people is still lack of caring. Lack of caring and love, ignorance, selfishness, pride, conflict, abuse of power, judgmentalism, bigotry. Let's not fool ourselves to think that we've, we're immune to any of these things. We still get tempted. We still get caught up. All of these diseases can succeed in killing the collective body and spirit. And so we are to go. We are to go and bring this healing, peace, understanding, and justice. Our message, just as it was for Christ, our message is also to protect the helpless, the brokenhearted who are being harassed, as Matthew tells us. It's only the powerless, not the powerful, who can be harassed. You can't be harassed when you have power. We're supposed to be there for the powerless. We're supposed to bring the empowerment of God to those in need. 
when you examine your heart, when you really look inside yourself, what is your capacity for the compassion of God to motivate and inspire you to Christian service? What is your capacity for the compassion of God to motivate and inspire you to Christian service? The English philosopher Edmund Burke said, evil triumphs because good men do nothing. We've seen the wide protest still going on for racial justice and an end to the rampant killing and abuse of innocent black lives. Even though this past week, so many stories keep surfacing. They still keep surfacing in the news about the deep systemic problems with police violence, the killing of black people. This is just reflective of the overall systemic problems in our society and the world and disparity of the worth and value of lives. Some lives are assumed more valued than others. And you know, this is the reality in which the disciples of Christ are commissioned to proclaim the message of God. We are commissioned to greater commitment a commitment driven by compassion. We will not succeed with a lukewarm outlook or just hoping for the best and then leaving it up to others. That's not my responsibility. Someone else will take care of that. The loving way of God through Jesus Christ is here for us, all of us. We all have a mission. We must remember that Christianity exists not to discourage, but to encourage, not to press people down with burdens, but to lift them up with mercy, God's mercy. St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel always, if necessary, Use words. We can convey the gospel message in so many different ways, forms, and avenues. And Jesus illustrates the way of compassionate conduct, compassionate giving of our hearts to others. Jesus saw the brokenness of the people and he came to them. Friends, Matthew tells us the crops are ready. The harvest is large, but the workers are few to gather it. Just as with Jesus, in our service to others, we are to be driven solely by our motive of compassion, care, and love. Jesus said in John 13, 35, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Love, God's love is visible, is tangible. People will receive it. People will recognize our acts of love, our expressions of love. We're here today because we say we know Jesus. We're here today because we are his church. The Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple, once said, church is the only society on earth that exists for the benefit of non-members. It's not about us. It's about people who are not here. The harvest is there. It's there for the doing. We're not here for ourselves. 
We're here for others, for those who don't yet know Christ, who have not yet experienced the love that God has to give us through Jesus Christ. They are the cause for the mission. They are why we are motivated to go out into the world and proclaim the good news. As people who are on this mission, we must, we must become Jesus to the crowds today. As people of audacious and stubborn hope, we believe that it's a mission that's entirely possible. Thanks be to God, and we give God all praise and glory this day. Let us pray. O oh, compassionate God, the world is full of people who are wounded, bruised, broken, cast down, bleeding, slowly dying. As long as we close our eyes, we'll never see what Jesus saw with such compassion. And so we pray, open our eyes, that we may see the world through your eyes, that we may know the needs of the people through your heart, that we may respond in love as much as you have loved the world. Through Christ we pray, amen. In Revelation 3, the Apostle John writes to the church in the city of Laodicea, and he tells them that they have become too comfortable, too spiritually comfortable, and that they need to make their commitment to Christ. And so that's a strong message for us today. So this song is actually a prayer of lament, um, lamenting the fact that we have become comfortable as the people of God. But it's also a, a call to hope and a call to stronger and deeper commitment. And so Laodicea represents our perhaps lackadaisical spiritual attitude. And it is emboldening us to live uh, a closer commitment to Christ and a closer uh, walk with him as we do our best especially in, with all the things that are going on uh, around us today, that as Christians, as believers in God's message, that we need to do better. We really need to show God's message in this world and all that we do and all that we say and all the, the different ways that we treat one another. And this is, the song is called Living in Laodicea. Living in 
Now let's sing our next hymn, number 635, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You.
Recently, a, a letter, an official letter came out uh, written by our current moderator, the Reverend Amanda Curry. And this was addressing the events that are going on right now, um, particularly in the United States, but also addressing our Canadian situation as well with the protests and the racial struggles that, that are still ongoing. And so uh, I would like to read uh, a portion of this letter. Uh, you're free to read the full letter on the website of the Presbyterian Church. It's presbyterian.ca, and you can read the full letter there. But I just want to share uh, a few excerpts uh, from that address. We have failed so completely in building societies that truly honor all people and celebrate our diversity as God's beloved children. I know that many ministers in our denomination struggle to find words to speak to what happened to George Floyd in Minneapolis, a black man murdered by a white police officer on a public street while others stood by and watched. The image of that knee on the back of his neck and the sound of his voice crying, I can't breathe, will stay with us for a long time. As a white woman with more privilege than I yet understand, I struggled to know what to say or what to pray. What I have learned is that these protests are not only about George Floyd's death, they're more about the pervasive and systemic racism that endangers the lives of black people every day. I've been reminded that this is just not an American problem. Canada is not immune to anti-black racism. It pains me to say it, but I've been challenged to see that our churches also are plagued with racism. Our church's official statements on racism and racial diversity have not put an end to actual racist comments, actions, and discrimination that are part of the experience of many black ministers and church members. We the church should take up our responsibility to speak and to act for justice for those who are being oppressed, abused, and killed. We must do something because black lives matter. Many of our black friends, neighbors, and fellow church members are hurting deeply right now. Or they're angry, or afraid, or just emotionally exhausted. It is our responsibility to speak and to act for justice. May the Holy Spirit of God come upon the church to burn away all that is wrong and spur us to speak and to act for justice. May the Holy Spirit of God blow through our communities, bringing life and hope to all who are oppressed and living in fear so that our black siblings may breathe deeply and have peace. The Reverend Amanda Curry, moderator of the General Assembly. And so I'd just like to express my appreciation to her. And as I said, you can read the full letter on the uh, webpage of the Presbyterian Church. That's presbyterian.ca. Now let us join together in prayer. O oh God, ever loving, ever leading, we turn to you in uncertain times, trusting in your steadfast love. Wherever people are anxious about the future, overwhelmed by all that's happening around them, or worried from the upheavals the pandemic has caused, bring your peace and hope, we pray. God of all compassion, where people are lonely or isolated, longing for love, where people are trapped in unhealthy relationships or facing violence each day, 
where people are grieving the loss of routines or purpose in their lives or the loss of someone beloved. Bring courage, we pray. God of tender strength, where people feel pain in their bodies, minds, or spirits, where people seek healing, where illness has eroded hope, bring your healing and hope, we pray. We lift up those among us, those in our hearts and minds. We pray for the Smith family, Sean, Sonyoung, Veronica, and Calvin. We pray for Florence Hines. We lift up Kathy Ho. We pray with thanks for George Halt and his ministry with us. We lift up Shirley Hazel and pray for her continued guidance and your presence with her. We pray for the Siegel family as they mourn the passing of Margaret. Bring your peace and comfort to all of them. God in whom we live and move and have our being, by your spirit, tend your promise of new life amid the current struggles in the world you love. Where hope flickers, reignite its power. Shine the light of Christ's love into each life and renew our trust in you this day and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now as we recognize our time for our offering, um, you are invited to go to our church website, uh, stmarkstoronto.org, and there is a donation button, and you have the opportunity to, to give, give of your offerings in, in support of this congregation, this ministry. And I just want to thank you in advance uh, for your givings. And so let's come to God as we prepare to give. God's goodness inspires us, even in times of suffering, so that we endure in faithfulness and find hope even amid difficulty. So we present our gifts to God in gratitude that God's love never lets us go. Let us give. God, our Good Shepherd, we're so grateful that you guide us through even the most difficult times. Bless our gifts and make them signs of your presence at work in the world for those who need to be embraced by your love and your strength. Through Christ we pray. Amen. And now let's join together as we sing our closing song, number 490, God of Grace and God of Glory.
And now let's join together for our benediction. May God's extravagant love consume you, Christ's passion inspire you, and the comforting spirit compel you to extraordinary love. And the blessing of God, creator, Christ, and comforter be upon you and remain with you always. We go out in peace in the courage and grace of Christ to share God's extravagant love. Amen. <laughs>